Hey, welcome to our YouTube channel. I'm so glad that you found us and I'm sure that each and every message you're gonna find on here is gonna bless your life. Here we are in our new series called Christ Alone. We're really focusing on Jesus. We head into Easter and I really believe that this message is gonna be clear and bring clarity to your life. So lean in, get ready. Get ready to encounter God as you hear this message. God bless. Grab your Bible out real quick. Let's turn to Colossians. We are kicking off a brand new series today called Christ Alone. Christ Alone. Please do not sit just yet. I want you to stay standing for the reading of God's Word. And uh, I'll let you sit with plenty of time to relax, kick back, and receive conviction today as you get ready to receive the Word of God. But I want to stand for the reading of God's Word. Colossians chapter 1 says this in verse 15. It says, He, talking about Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. <laughs> as a global community, it is my aim as your pastor to get you ready for the Easter season. We are about four weeks away from Easter. An exciting opportunity for the church to proclaim the cross of Jesus Christ. And today I wanna, I wanna take specifically a teaching approach to ensure that we all have a firm theological foundation when it comes to our understanding of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And I wanna do that today with a, a sermon I'm simply entitling, Just Jesus. Just Jesus. I wanna center around the cross. I wanna center around the person of Jesus and I can't think of any way to complicate it so I might simplify it and preach just Jesus today. Are you ready for the Word of God? You prepare your hearts. I want you to do this as you prepare your minds for the Word of God. I want you to find five of the most attractive people you can find in your immediate vicinity and give them a high five. Would you do that real quick? Would you do that? Give them a compliment by giving them a high five. Come on, Oakland. Come on, San Francisco, Mountain View, Honolulu, Chicago. Let's go. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Got to be honest with you, I'm a little bit excited and giddy. It's just hours now before we record our new album. And uh, I got I to gotta be honest, I love our album recordings and what we get to do in capturing the presence of God on, an, on a record. And and uh, it makes me think, of, think back to the first album that we ever recorded. It wasn't with Vibe Church. It was with our youth ministry, WG. WG stood for Weapon Generation. That's what we called our, our youth ministry, not because we wanted to weaponize them in that sense, but we wanted them to see themselves as weapons in the hand of God. My goodness, that's good preaching. That's a great name, Weapon Generation. It was a generation of young people who are mighty in warfare and knew their authority in Christ Jesus. And that was the sound of our music as well, wasn't it, babe? We would, we would, we would break strongholds out on campgrounds and deliver kids of all kinds of lustful things. You know, it was amazing time in youth. How many people know youth ministry? That's what youth ministry is about. Make them pure in the name of Jesus. Give them purpose. And uh, with our album recording, believe it or not, we, we secured an album tour in Indonesia, an international album tour. Our album did really well in Indonesia. It didn't do very good in Australia at the time, but for some reason we did really good in Southeast Asia. And so we had these churches call us and say, can we come and do an album tour? I was so excited to take Pastor Carly and the team and we went on a little album tour. And what I was surprised to experience, having never been to Indonesia at the time when we landed, just how spiritual Indonesia was. Like I'm talking about idols everywhere. I mean, you'd walk down the street and you have to step over some sacrifice to some kind of God that was putting a blessing or hoping to get a blessing on their business. 
every restaurant, every storefront, everything was spiritual. Even from the moment we landed the cab that we got into, the cab driver had an idol to all these different gods along the dash. Had like a little chubby Buddha on, on the front one. Then there was a cross and there was like some Hindu thing. And then there was like rosary beads. There was all these different idols and, and I couldn't help myself. My personality, Kira will actually tell me when we go places, she says, hey, honey, you're going to behave tonight. <laughs> Any husbands get that from their wives. She'll say, um, um, honey, are you gonna, you're going to, what she means is, Adam, you don't have to challenge everyone and everything. You can be cordial. You can just let people stay stuck in their mess. I'm like, I cannot. I can't do it. And so in this situation, we got in the cab and I couldn't do it. I had to say it. I said, sir, it looks like you're quite spiritual there. And, and he began to proceed and tell me about the different things that he prays to. And I said, wow, you, you pray a lot. Uh, and he said, yeah, who do you pray to? I said, just Jesus. Now, the way he received it wasn't the way I meant it. The way I meant it is I'm directing all my prayers to Jesus. He kind of scoffed like, oh, you've only got Jesus? What was fascinating to me that in the midst of his paraphernalia, he had a cross, but he had no conviction. I want to do something at the beginning of our series, Christ Alone. I want to make sure we can shore up our conviction around what it means to walk a life with Jesus. I want to make sure that what we know isn't that we just know about Jesus, but we actually know Jesus. There's a difference. There is a distinct difference in knowing about somebody and actually knowing someone. And it's most often, often evident in the way that we live our lives, in the decisions that we make, because you can easily be holding on to some religious ideals, but lacking the relational conviction that actually keeps you in Christ. Yeah. It's not just going through some religious rituals. Are you here today? Yeah. It's about actually having a, a deep relational conviction yeah. that keeps us centered in Christ. And the Bible, believe it or not, is kind of direct with this stuff. The, the Bible doesn't just have nice passages. The Bible has convicting passages. In fact, if you haven't read a convicting passage, you've stayed in the nice, sweet passages. There is some, there is some heavy stuff in the Bible that I read that I'm like, yo. Like, can I show you one real quick? This will be cause for some concern for some people today. And I want to prepare your hearts. I'm about to read something that may concern you. It may cause you at the beginning of this sermon to put a lens on your life and to consider that maybe God might be speaking to me today. Are you ready for this? I got about 70% nods in the audience. That's all I need. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Bible. I didn't make that up. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. This is heavy stuff in Scripture from Jesus. It's not just about what you say. It's about what you do. So I want to do something today. I want to, I want to shore up our salvation as a church. I want to, for some of you, introduce you and for some of you, reintroduce you to the person of Jesus yeah. in the hope that it may just unlock something for you today. That's actually the word that I've been really praying, that word unlock. Yeah. As we head into Flowcon this week, I've been praying that over Flowcon that there would be, we've got hundreds of investors and inventors and innovators coming along together to actually gather together. And I know they're all going to be leaning into some kind of revelation that will unlock breakthrough for their company or unlock breakthrough in funding or unlock something. But I hate to tell you, and I'm going to tell you ahead of time, but the greatest unlock probably in the modern history has already happened. It happened with the Reformation. Yes. It was an unlock of revelation around scriptural accuracy that that, that revealed Christ not as a commodity in the way that the medieval church had used Christ to control people, but, but to understand that it was by Christ alone or just Jesus and what that meant in contrast with the burdensome requirements of man-made religion. So in that spirit today, 
I want to reveal Jesus to you. Only Jesus and all of Jesus. For starters, what we need to do, I want you to take notes today. This is going to be helpful as you're sharing this with your friends and maybe your family. For starters, we need to reconcile a potential misunderstanding regarding the differential between Jesus as the Son of God and God the Father. I've had so many people tell me from time to time, oh, Pastor, I've got a hard time connecting with the idea of God as a Father because they have a poor image or relationship with their earthly Father. Anybody ever heard that? Like it's a real, I've got a bad image with my, my father, so I can't connect with God the Father. Instead, they say, oh, I'm going to just stick with Jesus because their idea of Jesus is gentle and kind and maybe meek and mild, where God to them is angry and full of wrath. Well, allow me to correct this notion for a moment because as we see in Colossians, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We're actually going to find something similar If you go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. So what the Bible is trying to marry up for you is for you to realize that while God is distinct in the Godhead, there is a clear connection or unity within the Godhead. Even Jesus himself says in John 14, 9, he says that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, for I am the Father and the Father is in me. That's what Jesus is saying. There's There's no difference between us that I do what the Father does. This is what he actually says a little bit later in John 5, 19, revealing that the Son does nothing on his own. He only does what he sees the Father doing. For what the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus is trying to emphasize the fact that even though there is a distinction in the Godhead, there's unity. That if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I don't act on my own, but we act together to outwork the will and God's plan for your redemption. So if you've seen Jesus... You're seeing God. And Paul seems to articulate it perfectly in verse 19 of our scripture today. It says, In Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to, to dwell. What a, what a powerful line. That in Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. What does that mean? Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. If at any point today you feel like saying amen, Amen. feel free. (laughs) If you're a nonverbal communicator, just raise a hand. That's acceptable in church, by the way. That won't be taken as me as you're asking a question. (laughs) It will be taken as me as you just saying amen, but I'm nonverbal. And that's fine too, because I'm preaching straight Bible. I'm preaching about Jesus. It doesn't get better preaching than preaching about Jesus. Sure, my tone could change or my style could change, but the authenticity of the word is straight, unadulterated Jesus today. You see, Jesus came into the world fully man and completely God to be the champion of our faith. Enduring hate, he was inflicted with pain. He took on shame all for our sake known as the Lamb of God, becoming the sacrifice for our sins and shouldering the weight that we could not bear all because of love. (laughs) A love so rich and so potent and so powerful that He willfully laid down His life so that we could have life. This is Jesus. And as wild as it all seems, it's the very reason as Christians, we worship the only one worthy of it. Do you know this as Christians, we, we don't give away worship to worthless things. We don't divide our worship. We don't divvy up our worship to, to lifeless lords and to covering our bases. We don't add to Jesus, it's just Jesus. See, this is what it means to be a true Christian is to have a sole focus on the one true King. I know this could be strange to understand because maybe your religious background has taught you to divide your praise. That sure, Jesus is important, but you've got other people that are just as important. Maybe Mother Mary 
seems to be just as important. Maybe there's a saint that has done some great works and deserves some of my prayers and some of my praise. Or, or may, maybe there's a, a past relational figure that has passed and now I need some extra favor in heaven. So let me pray to them to intercede for me. No, no, no. I got to tell you and I got to correct your thinking that as a Christ follower, you have direct access to Jesus. So why would I divert my prayers to anybody else to get to Jesus when I've been given full access to the very throne room of God? I can bring my prayer and bring my praise and give it to the one alone that is worthy. I ain't about to say that some people aren't worthy of honour. The Bible says that. But honour is different from prayer. I give my prayer to the one who can do something with my prayer. (laughs) This is a wild thought. It's crazy that we would reserve and commit and direct all of our worship to one? To the one who is truly worthy of it? That we wouldn't hedge our bets and have a few extra idols just in case? You see, what you miss, and I've seen this, I've I've been in people's homes, Christians, and it's like there's some latent old idols from their past that they're like, oh, no, no, that's just, there's just like, you know, family heirloom, but it's sitting at a place of prominence in your life. You see, to leave your old life and to follow Christ means I cut off everything from my past and I look only to Him. That I'm not trying to hedge my bets just in case there's a little blessing somewhere else. Because any praise that I give diffuses the praise that I give to God. Hmm. You see, what... What we have to understand is by directing all of our unreserved adoration to the one, we actually declare that Jesus of all the humans that had ever lived is indeed God in the flesh and blood or he isn't. What declares Jesus as Lord is your sole focus of praise. In fact, it's only by encountering Jesus that you, actually, you can ever hope to get a clear picture of God. As Paul kind of reveals to the Colossians, he he wants them to know that Jesus is both supreme and sovereign. And in one sentence, really a singular sentence, he reveals both the supremacy and the sovereignty of Christ in one beautiful articulation. It's in verse 17. He says it this way. He says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. You're going to be hard-pressed to find a better sentence in Scripture that reveals both the the supremacy and the sovereignty of God. Supreme because He's first. Supreme because He's better. Supreme because He is the firstborn of all creation. Not the firstborn in creation. There's a difference. He's the firstborn of creation, which simply reveals that He is first and of most importance. But He's not only before all things. He is also sovereign, which means He is over all things. He is in control. That's who I want to pray to. I don't want to pray to somebody who's not in control and total control. I don't want to have my prayer praying to some distant deity that just encourages them to to get better. No, I want to pray to the one who has power to do something about my situation. And because God is sovereign, He can do something. He is supreme and He is sovereign. A better way to say that is He is the way. Actually, let me correct that. He is the only way. This is what Jesus himself reveals in John 14, 6, saying, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Check out the severity of this. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did you get that? Jesus wasn't playing. And Jesus wasn't doing this to be harsh. Jesus wasn't doing this because he was, he was somewhat jealous for people's praise, saying, look, I'm the best, I'm the only way. No, no, there wasn't any insecurity in Jesus. It was the kindness of Jesus to make what was clear that could have been confusing because Jesus didn't want people to get to the end of eternity and somehow we could blame Him for not being clear. Well, I thought that you could have worked through this way or I, could, I thought you could have worked through this way. I thought because my parents had a faith that somehow that faith would have trickled down to me and I would have been safe. But, but, but He wants to say, I could stand in eternity and say, you made it very clear that you said you are the way the truth and the life and that no one gets to the Father but through Jesus. See, what the world would see as restrictive, we see as Christians as clear. 
It's abundantly clear. There ain't no confusion. Jesus doesn't mix words. In the kindness of who He is, He makes it so clarifying that there is one way it is Jesus. And it's so helpful because I want to make sure that you get this in your spirit. Because I know that what we, what, what we see in the world, the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the world wants to do it this way, that, that maybe there are many ways. Right. The wisdom of the world ha- wants to project that surely if God is fair, yeah. He would see the intent. Mm-hmm. That even though you're worshipping a, a God with another name, the intention is the right. See, that's the way the world thinks in the world's wisdom. Sure. The world has a wisdom. Man, where is it anywhere in the Bible does it talk about life being fair? Right. The closest thing you're going to get in Scripture to fairness is where the Bible says that God man created man and woman equal. That you were created equal. So you started equal, not that you end equal. Because you start equal, you all start from the same point. And everything that God has made available is available to you, but it's what you do with what God gives you that determines where you end up. Are you with me? But in the world's wisdom, wouldn't it just be nice that whatever path we pick in life, whatever religion we follow, whatever Near Eastern or modern or Orthodox religion, whatever we want to follow will all get us to the same place. But Jesus makes it clear. Matthew 7, let me show you. Verse 13. Ooh, this is heavy. I'm preparing you with a little ooh. In Matthew 7, 13, it says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell, <laughs> listen to this, the highway. The highway to hell is broad and its gates is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only few will ever find it. Yep. Talking about highways. You ever been driving behind someone that had that bumper sticker coexist? You've seen it? It's like all these little different emblems of different religions that make up the word coexist, which is a nice thought, isn't it? But can't we all just get along? Can't we all just believe what each of us want to believe and hope that that will work out in the end. That if you don't disturb me with your beliefs and I won't disturb you with your, uh, my beliefs and we can just get along. Now, I'm going to tell you for most religions that will work. You believe what you want to believe. We all end up at the same place. But for Christians who know the truth, that not all those roads lead to the same place. Those roads lead to bondage. And further separation from the truth. So we got something in us that when we know the truth, we can't hide the truth. We can't hide it under a lamp. We can't hide it under a bushel. Because we have been filled with the love of Christ, we love people enough to tell them the truth. So I'm the guy at the party getting agitated when there's like, can't we just get along? No, no, I got the truth and it's burning within me and I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to blame me when you get there and you realise that I didn't tell you the truth. So I'm going to tell you He's the only way. Because what you want me to do is you want me to be wrong to get along. Don't work in my life. I ain't just going to be wrong to get along. I'm going to be truthful in the hope that even in the truth, even if you don't like me, you'll find Jesus. You might not like my approach, but I'm going to do the best I can to model Jesus. But the message that I'm trying to bring to you is that it's by Christ alone that you are saved. (laughs) It's clear it's just Jesus. There's no other person. There's no other path that can make us right with God. It's just Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Scripture is so clear. I'm thankful for clear Scripture. Anybody with me? I'm so thankful that Scripture isn't ambiguous, that Scripture isn't playing around and playing metaphors, that Scripture just comes straight between the eyes like a rock from David's sling into Goliath's forehead. There is a Scripture. It's one man, one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. It's the man Christ Jesus. (laughs) 
Salvation cannot come by any other means. It cannot be earned. Salvation relies entirely on the righteousness of Jesus as a sole basis. Actually, I want to do my job real well. I committed this series as we lead into Easter that I want to, I want to pass to you really, really well and make sure that as a church, we can be an army of people that understand who we are in Christ Jesus. And I want to make sure this comes through to Mountain View well today, to Oakland, to San Francisco. I want, I want to make sure this hits Honolulu and everybody. So can we put up my Roman scripture real quick? I want to put up Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Because this, this gets heavy, but it gets clear. And check it out. Here it is. It says, For if because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man. It's talking about Adam. That one man, because of sin, entered all of humanity. We then fought, therefore carry a sin nature. So if that one act of sin was enough to condemn us, check out what it says, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. What it's saying is if the one man, Adam's sin was enough to condemn us, guess what? The one man's grace, Jesus, who was sinless and perfect, can also redeem us. Let's go to the next verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. What is this Scripture saying? Let me summarise it. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. You don't, know, you don't need Jesus and. You don't need a prayer to Jesus and a prayer to this thing. You don't need Jesus and some paraphernalia from your religious aunt. I'm talking to store shop owners. You don't need the cat at the front of the store. I don't know what it's praying some money. You're, you are praying a curse because you're dividing your focus amongst an idol and you're hoping to get from Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way and it was an exclusive way. <laughs> Jesus is enough. He is more than enough. He is more than you need, more than you can hope for, more than you can imagine. Jesus is enough for all. It's good teaching. Maybe I could say it this way. God has nothing else to give. Hmm. Did I say that right? I said it how I wrote it. <laughs> God has nothing else to give because in giving Jesus, He gave it all. Jesus didn't hold something back for when you mature to a new level of revelation that you unlock a new and fast track way of praying to some other deity. No, no, He said, here's Jesus, He is enough. Jesus will sacrifice His life and He will suffice every debt that you owe. He is a once and for all. You don't need to keep coming back with sacrifices. His life, sacrifice, the perfect life is enough for all men for all time. All things, all men, all sins, all time, no matter what it is, no matter what you've done, He is enough. He is the sustaining sacrifice that is sufficient for your sins. He's all. He's all. He's all. And he gave everything because we get all of Jesus. God did not send some, you know, high ranking angel. He, he didn't send so, someone who would do for an intermediate. He sent Jesus. And what Jesus did is he didn't just give part. He gave it all. He gave his life. You've got to understand that Jesus is all in on you. He's all in. On you. This is what it means to be in Christ, by the way. In 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Can I tell you what it means to be in Christ? Yes. To be in Christ means you get all of Jesus and everything that comes with Jesus. There are so many believers that don't even know all that come with Jesus. Right. Like, like, like you don't even, you haven't even yet unlocked all the blessings that come with Jesus. When Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, 
he writes and he lists kind of like a long list of treasury items that you now have access to because you're royal. Because you're now son and daughter of the Most High King, everything that Jesus has, you have access to. And he begins to list these things that most believers don't even know all the things they get. For instance, he talks about the fact that we now have every spiritual blessing in heavenly realms. He talks about the joy of being chosen before the foundation of the world. He talks about the promise of being made holy and blameless. He talks about the eternal adoption to him himself as sons. He talks about redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins. He talks about the rich, riches of his grace. He talks about the gift of knowing the mystery of God. That pre, that pre Christ, you were literally blind and you could not see. But because of Christ, the scales have fallen from your eyes. And now you see with clarity the mystery that God is working all things together for the glory of God and for the goodness of you. He talks about the inheritance in heaven. He talks about the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a seal and guarantee. Jesus doesn't just redeem you from your past. Jesus gives you a bright future with, with abundant blessings. So since Jesus is enough, and since we get all of Jesus when we come to Jesus, I need to change the orientation of my question. I don't need to ask, is Jesus enough? I have all of Jesus. So the question is, does Jesus have all of me? This is the only valid question you get to ask. Scripture is emphatic that you get all that comes with Jesus. The question is, have I given all of me? Have I given or do I have divided attention and divided worship? Have I added Jesus like a trinket? Yeah. Yeah. Have I added Jesus as a fail-safe prayer in the moments that I need it most, but neglect Him on the every day? So you might not be thinking I worship idols, but where do you give your attention? Where do you give your affection? For some of you, sport is more of an idol than a little chubby Buddha sitting on a bench. I got nothing against sports, love it. But my praise will not be for a team that doesn't know my name, but for a king who knew my name and bore my name and called my name and called me up out of the grave and into eternal life. Has Jesus got all of you? Jesus held nothing back. Why would you take hold of God with one hand? That's what we're doing. You might be saying, I've got, I've got a hold of Jesus. Yeah, but it's like that one hand hold. It's like I got Jesus here, but I'm still holding on to everything else just in case. Like my cab driver, covering my bases, hedging my bets. <laughs> this is a two hand hold kind of faith church. Jesus looks for both hands, not in part, but all in. That's what Jesus looks for. And I want to show you because this is what Paul's talking about for the sake of Christ in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider as a loss for the sake of Christ. Did you get that? Paul is talking about everything pre-Christ and now post-Christ. He said, there was a point in time where I had accredited and amassed a lot of recommendations, accreditations and reputations. I had built a life for myself that would come out of who I'd been and the importance of my life. I had a religious regimen that most people would be jealous of. I was a man. I was a player. I was the main thing. But now that I've found Christ, I look at everything that I consider as gain and I see it as loss. I'm not holding on to that end Christ. I've let go of the past. I've grabbed hold of the future with both hands. What is more, he says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Check this out. He says, I want to know Christ. I want to I wanna know Christ. Christ. 
I don't want to just know about him. I want to know him. I don't want to just know about him in the mix of the things that I give my praise to. I want to know, I want a relationship with him. Paul says that I want to know Christ. Yes, to the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, if that's what it takes, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This, my friends, is the action of surrender. There's a word for it that we don't use so often. It's called consecration. Can I teach you about that real quick? Would you take a seat just for a second? I, I, I got a couple more minutes. I got to teach you this. Consecration. We don't use this word so often. To consecrate. To consecrate. But this is what exclusive worship means. It's consecration. We are called to be consecrated, which is devoting or, or setting apart exclusively for worship and service to God. You know, when Kira and I got married, we, we got a lot of wedding gifts because we had a lot of friends. It, it ain't a flex, it's a fact. We were liked. And in the midst of the gifts, we had someone give us some really nice and expensive like dishes, fine china dishes. And, and, and it was cool, but, but Kira did the thing she did straight away. She took them and she put them in the top shelf of the cupboard so I couldn't get to them. Because she didn't want to walk down and see me eating my Fruit Loops out of these fine china. And we hardly ever used them. I only used them like a couple of times, only when very, very special people came over. But what you could have said is that those dishes were consecrated because they were set apart for special use. I'm here to tell you that that's what your life looks like with Christ. The moment you come into Christ, you are consecrated because you are set apart for special service, service to the great King. You are a consecrated person because your worship is solely and wholly to the one who is worthy of your worship. You aren't adulterating your worship by giving it out to each and every Lord or deity that's out there that's claiming to be something. You are saying, my God is the one true God and I will reserve my entire worship to the one King, the one Lord, the name of above all names, that at that name every knee shall bow, and at that name every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 